Hello. Thank you all out there for joining me today. And us, I'm sorry. Uh, we've got Chris Stott up in Madison. Uh, everyone. The controls. Uh, and me here in Chicago, Rick Harnish, the Executive Director of the High Speed Rail Alliance. Um, and today we're here to talk about regional rail. Uh, I want to set some expectations up in advance, which is I have been working to explain why corridors should not launch with just two or three trains a day, uh, but should launch with a train at least every two hours, um, if not hourly, um, and have been uh, working to build that case. And so today, I'm going to lay out some thoughts around that. Um, and then if folks in the audience have um, some ideas on how to build on the thoughts and make a more cohesive case, um, let's go. Let's have a discussion. So today's more of a, um, and we do have a smaller audience than usual today. So let's think of this as in the old days before Zoom, when a group of people got together and tried to hash out an idea, uh, this is not the let's get in an auditorium and have a, a presentation. Um, so uh, as we move forward, Chris will be watching the questions and answers. Uh, please, if you have questions, put them in there. Um, he may interrupt me if there's a question that's really worth um, going on. So again, if this was in a room, I'd say, you know, interrupt me if you have a really important question. Uh, so Chris's job is to do that today. Um, and for those who are just joining us, uh, the High Speed Rail Alliance is a nonprofit advocacy organization. Um, we are advocating for uh, connecting people better, connecting communities better, um, and making travel by making travel more enjoyable, more productive. Um, and safer uh, through fast, frequent, and dependable trains uh, working in an integrated network connecting entire regions. Uh, so let's get started. And again, if you have questions, the question and answer place is the place to do that. Um, so let's define what regional rail is um, and um, uh, because like with everything, there are different definitions. So for today, uh, we're talking about using frequent trains on memory schedules uh, to serve many types of trips throughout the day. Uh, and that throughout the day is, is very important. Um, so we have a picture here to illustrate this of uh, the town of Arv Arvada, Colorado, uh, where Denver started from scratch. They built a new regional uh, railroad um, on three or four lines. Um, and because they did it from scratch and totally separate from the freight network, uh, they were able to start off with um, level boarding, electrified EMUs, and highly frequent service. Uh, throughout the day, and not just on weekdays. Um, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But that's one example of what regional rail is. Um, as an aside, um, we, because railroads are incredibly versatile, and you can put different pieces together in different ways, uh, we are trying to narrow the discussion down to three categories so that we can think more about this. Um, and we've got shared use lines where passenger trains and freight trains um, are sharing the tracks and both are fairly frequent, preferably. Uh, but the infrastructure is really designed for long, heavy freight trains. Uh, this can work. Um, it doesn't work over most of the country because we haven't invested in the tracks that make it possible but it is proven to work on the Chicago to Elburn and Chicago to Aurora uh, metro lines where the track infrastructure is up to the task of running 90 plus passenger trains a day plus 
um, uh, heavy long freight trains. Now, in both cases, both users would like to have their separate infrastructure, but it, it does work and it works well because the investment is there. Uh, regional lines, which we have a lot of descriptive problems in this business. Um, in this definition, regional lines is the infrastructure where you're focused on running passenger trains, um, preferably electrified, um, perhaps with a few freight trains. And the most robust version of a regional line in this country is the Washington, New York, Boston, uh, what some people call the Acela Corridor, all others call uh, the uh, Northeast Corridor. Uh, and this is where our fastest trains today are running, the Acela trains, high-speed trains, but not running on high-speed track, uh, so not running to their maximum capability. And then over on the right-hand side is new high-speed lines where you're building completely from scratch with no grade crossing, so you don't have the safety and dependability issues of having cars and people on the tracks, electrification so that you can accelerate faster, go faster, um, and totally separate from heavy trains so that you can build the tracks to be really rigid, um, which means you can go very fast. Now, the interesting thing is that high-speed lines sometimes have what we call regional rail service and sometimes don't. Um, so for example, Paris to Lyon is a high-speed line. They have incredibly frequent service, but it's not the same pattern every hour. Um, and so that's a high-speed service, but not regional. On the other hand, uh, between Frankfurt and, and Berlin, the trains are using high-speed track for a portion of it, but they are on a regular schedule with the same schedule every hour. So that's regional high speed. It gets very confusing, but the point that we're trying to get to today is having frequent memory schedules is incredibly important uh, to having effective competitive train service. So coming back to those Denver examples, um, this is the Sunday schedule. Um, and it's not the time of departure, it's trains per hour. So you've got in that dark of the night, uh, you've got zero trains per hour. Um, but on the Arvada line, you go to a train every 30 minutes, uh, starting essentially from about 4.15 um, until about midnight or until midnight. And then on the line that goes to the airport, um, in the middle of the day, you've got a train every 15 minutes, um, and they are scheduled to be every 15 minutes. And then in the evening, that drops down to every half hour. Um, so again, thinking about trains per hour on a repeating schedule, as opposed to uh, trains per day, when the trains could be at any point during the day. Um, and this becomes very important, not only for the customer, we'll talk about that, but in terms of operations planning, uh, so that uh, you know that this train every hour is coming at this point. So if you want a different kind of train, you need to put it at this point. You're not having a different plan throughout the day. It's a very structured, which makes it much more reliable. Um, it makes it much easier to design the infrastructure so that that can be less expensive. Um, and better use of the operating employees and the rolling equipment, so that can be less expensive. But this is the basic concept for what regional rail should look like. And then you keep splitting in half. So the next, you might have tw every 20 minutes, or instead of that, maybe you go to every seven and a half minutes, et cetera. So um, we don't have examples of this on intercity service to a great degree. The first one coming out of the box is Brightline, which just launched. And again, because they rebuilt the infrastructure to do this on the existing freight line along the coast, plus built a new uh, dedicated line between the coast and, and the airport. 
Brightline is launching with a train every two hours, uh, but that's just as they um, build in the safety protocols, the operating protocols, et cetera. Um, so they're really in a demonstration period right now. They'll go to every hour. And again, it's that flexibility. The San Joaquin's is a little bit different going between Bakersfield and Oakland because they're on a single track shared use line uh, that hasn't had regional service in the past, but they've been slowly building it up so that they can. Um, and today they've got six trains a day on the main trunk. Um, and they intended to have nine by now, but that um, got delayed because of COVID. But they have got into the area where they've got a train every two hours, mostly with some gaps, so they can add in um, as they move forward. Um, and the interesting thing is here, the the uh, Merced to Bakersfield portion of this will actually go uh, to half hour service when they build a new high speed line. So we have some limiting concepts that have kept us from being able to think about this on an inner city basis. Um, and it kind of goes back to history. So the first point is um, that in the 60s, when the railroad network was collapsing, the only folks that really had the power in order to keep their trains were those few cities that had a lot of people going from suburbs into the city for work. Um, so we created a category of trains called commuter trains that fit that power block. Um, so they're very focused on getting people from the suburbs to downtown. It only works in a very few places. Um, and those are the places that we have that traditional commuter rail service today. Um, and then we also set that up in a separate funding and governance structure, which is limited to metro areas. Um, so there's a growing uh, belief, um, and Metro has fully endorsed this, um, you know, we talked about Denver, which began with regional service to begin with. Um, others have been thinking about what do we do about creating that service throughout the day, as opposed to just getting from suburbs to downtown. Then we have this concept of inner city, which for some reason is believed that it needs to be a couple of trains a day to be intercity. And the only reason I can think of for that is the railroads never had good intercity service, that it only was two or three trains a day at the most. Um, and so people really haven't thought outside of that box. And then we've also got the problem that those trains are funded differently. Today, they're funded through states, even though all of the corridors cross, for the most part cross state lines. Um, and so it's very difficult to think outside of the box on inner city. And then again, we're very focused on big city um, without recognizing that lots of small cities together can actually build volume uh, because train advocates have been very less than optimistic, pessimistic about what trains can actually do. So they're focused on, well, how do we get to that big city where all the volume is? Instead of thinking about how do we add up volumes in order to make things work. So the core reason that we should start thinking about frequent trains on memory schedules are because it brings more customers. So the infrastructure that you build gets a lot more value because you've got a lot more customers, you've got more political support for it, um, and you've got a lot more revenue for it because you've got more people riding the train and paying fares. Um, and so this narrow focus on getting people to work really limits the size of the market uh, because actually getting to work on a regular basis every day is um, according to one uh, uh, website in the Census Bureau is only about 15% of the trips. So if you wanna have people on the trains, you've gotta do more than just get them to the downtown of a big city uh, for a business day. 
Uh, so because of that, because not everybody is going to a job during the day, travel happens throughout the day, not just at the peaks. Uh, so you've got to have trains throughout the day in order to make this work. Um, and if you've only got a train once in a while, uh, the sitting around waiting for a train really kills the competitiveness of the trip. Um, so this is, um, I forgot what the, the parameters were around this, but we had said, if you get out of your meeting at 1230 and the last train, the most recent train has departed at noon and you don't have another train till three, you're waiting around for a long time for that train. So if, you, if, if it's faster than the drive, it's still faster to drive. Um, so you really need to have trains scattered throughout the day in order uh, to be truly attractive. And then on, on top of that, um, as an example, in a recent uh, uh, podcast, the founder of FedEx talked about why he went to 24 hours a day. And it wasn't because the uh, one to three or the two to four in the, the early or parts of the morning part of the day um, were going to be profitable. It's because that increased to the business during the day. And that's because people could trust it. So somebody can trust that if I take the train to Springfield and I decide I want to stay until nine o'clock, there's a train to get me home. Um, or if you need to stay a, bit, a little bit later, right? So you have to have the trains on the shoulders that people probably won't ride in large numbers, but it what drives in the middle. Um, so you've got that reason for frequency. Then you've got the fact that people are traveling lots of places and you can't have service um, between all of those places. You have to have connections. And so you need to have the connections timed well, and that means the service has to be frequent in order to make the, the connections work at each connecting point and have the reliability at each of those connecting points. So that again says that every hour you have to have the same schedule so that at each connecting point, the trains meet each other at the right time so that somebody can ride from A to F or from C to D, uh, taking various connecting, connecting travels. So again, this is, and then the last kind of piece of this is people get on and off the train as the train goes. And if you're only focused on skimming off that peak on the ends, you're not getting the peaks in the middle. So you have to have a lot more frequent service even to get the peaks in the middle in order um, in order to serve uh, the whole market well. And now you've got the fact that because you're serving the peaks in the middle, you're also adding frequencies to the ends. So um, what might this look like on a corridor like Green Bay to Chicago? Um, and each of these is a break point um, in order to illustrate. So uh, it's not illustrated well, but I've, essentially this is Chicago, this is Evanston, this is Waukegan, this is Milwaukee, and this is Green Bay. So I'm not certain a train every two hours out of Green Bay is really enough to get the market. But let's be conservative and say we start with a train every two hours. Well, those trains every two hours would go all the way to Chicago. Um, and then certainly for Milwaukee, the minimum required is every hour. Um, so um, that would add in. Um, and so now you've got uh, some of these trains that are leaving every hour out of Chicago half of them stop at Milwaukee and half of them grow to Green Bay. The challenge is between maybe Kenosha or this gets complicated because there's actually commuter rail service headed back in the other way. Um, but maybe these are local trains and you've got one every half hour from Waukegan into Chicago and then every 15 minutes 
um, from Evanston into Chicago. And for this example, um, I just picked Evanston because it's a place that if you put the third track back in, you could have an, an easy transfer between the, the locals and the expresses. So now Evanston's got super high frequent service as does Waukegan and the intermediate parts have good service as well. Um, so, but you have to think about this as an integrated corridor, not as a separate inner city and a separate commuter rail service in order to truly make it work right, which again is difficult in this country because we've separated short distance and long distance into two separate funding and governance categories. But this is the basic concept of how I think we should be thinking about it. But let's add another layer to this. And I'm sorry that this is, is uh, the labels are set for vertical, but to make the, the picture bigger, I, I turned it. So let's look at this corridor here and go, okay, we've got Green Bay. Well, certainly there's an interesting, there's probably a lot of traffic between Oshkosh and Green Bay. And there's certainly a decent amount between Oshkosh and Nina. So that's why I'm saying maybe two, every two hours isn't good enough, but let's say every two hours. Um, then you've got the fact that people probably want to travel in big numbers from Green Bay. And again, it doesn't quite make sense to have their, your own trains from Green Bay to Madison. So Milwaukee could become the connecting point. And then if you had the same pattern, then people could understand that they could connect at Milwaukee to get to Madison and vice versa, or from Oconomowoc to Fond du Lac, again, really not a high traffic market, but if you add up Watertown to Ad Allentown, Watertown to Fond du Lac, Allentown to Oshkosh, plus all of those combinations, you're starting to really build something but you have to have a reliable, predictable connection at Milwaukee to make that happen. So again, you've got to have the same schedule every hour going through. And then in the previous example, I assumed that the hourly service out of Green Bay or that, that the service out of Green Bay goes to Chicago and maybe the service to Madison or goes along the lake and maybe the service to Madison goes on the existing Amtrak route don't really know. Nobody's thought about it at this scale. Um, today, the state of Wisconsin is just thinking about, let's do 10 trains a day to Milwaukee and have uh, some of them go to Madison, some go to St. Paul, and some go to Green Bay. What if we thought about this on a bigger scale? And right now, while we're thinking about it, and at the beginning of a 10-year process, instead of thinking small like this, Let's think about what happens if we really think about it as a network that's designed more than just to get some people to Chicago. It's really designed around getting people connected between many places to many places. Another example that I'd really love a volunteer to dig into and, and how this would work is the state of Michigan has only thought about 10 trains a day to Chicago. It's their, their most recent proposal for this was very Chicago focused. But you've got a major university and a small, uh, very attractive college in Kalamazoo. You've got um, kind of a, a center of excellence for pharmaceuticals in Kalamazoo. Battle Creek, you've got cereal companies plus a major military installation, Ann Arbor, um, major university. You've got Niles and Dowagiac uh, that with hourly service be, could become attractive places to live, to work in Kalamazoo or Battle Creek or Ann Arbor if the trains were fast enough. Um, certainly Grand Rapids to Detroit is a very important market. So if Michigan started you know, because the hardest part of this Detroit to Chicago corridor is essentially from the state line to Chicago. So what if the state of Michigan started saying, we're going to use regional rail to connect all of these points together, and you had an hourly train from Kalamazoo to Grand Rapids, 
and an hourly train from New Buffalo to Grand Rapids and across to Ann Arbor. And they all interconnected so that all of these cities could be interconnected together. Then you're really doing something and the state can now start to justify double tracking um, the Chicago to Detroit line um, on its own. And it can start justifying buying and double tracking from Grand Rapids to Ann Arbor and Detroit. Uh, because you've added up so many different types of riders, you really can start justifying doing that. And then you've got the feeder bus networks uh, that bring even more people into the network. So this is what I would like states to start thinking about. How do we start building regional rail networks that aren't just about the big cities, that work because the big cities are there, but because the small cities add up to a lot? Um, uh, probably going long. So uh, this is pre 110 mile an hour service. Oh no, this is the, the existing 110 mile an hour service. Um, we've, um, in our own world, um, I'm sending my writer to normal next week to do some interviews about uh, the downtown plan and how that relates to the, the uh, new 110 mile an hour service. He's got two or three interviews, one's in the morning, one's in the afternoon. Um, first train out of the day gets you there at 9.15, which is okay for a business day, not great. Uh, but because he can't do um, all of the interviews he wants to do by 11, he's stuck down there till 5.30. What if there was a more frequent service to give you more flexibility around that? Springfield, it gets worse. Um, because in Springfield, uh, the legislature wraps up at about three, sometimes two, who wants to stick around to, until 4.45 uh, to catch that train back. Um, and then you've got the, you've got, so there's layering issues like this throughout the corridor. Um, so I just, for schnicks, put together with that existing timetable, if you had a train every two hours, the service starts to work pretty well for those intermediate points and starts becoming very useful for folks. Um, but again, but then we lead to why speed is so important in this, because you can't really do Chicago to St. Louis um, or Springfield to St. Louis, because you would have to have trains originating in St. Louis to get you to St. Louis at the beginning of the day. So what you really need is a three hour, maybe you could get away with a four hour trip so that you could originate this five o'clock train out of Chicago and get you to St. Louis at the beginning of the business day. So you really have to add speed to frequency to really make this pop. But doing it at the existing conventional shared use speeds and doing it every two hours gets you started. Um, so that is again, some thoughts, not well baked. Um, hopefully that puts some ideas in people's heads. Um, would like to put some real effort into developing this concept further. Over the years, I've looked for research papers that talk about this, haven't found any. Uh, so this conversation was to get this, or this today was to get the conversation a little bit started a little bit better. Happy to take questions and and see what comes up. All right. Um, thanks, Rick. And uh, as someone who lives in Wisconsin, I, I loved your examples about uh, trips between uh, cities and, and suburbs in Wisconsin, the cities and suburbs around Milwaukee, because those drives can be really stressful, especially on the outskirts of the city when things, uh, when the interstate gets crowded and a train, of course, could sidestep all of that. Um, we have a couple of questions and uh, definitely invite more since we're a smaller, more intimate group today. Uh, a, a couple of the questions that we have right out of the gate are, um, we have a, a couple uh, just about how to classify the train systems uh, that exist in different metro areas right now. Um, Thor uh, points out that New Jersey Transit goes between a very large city and the state capital. Uh, and, and asks, would the New Jersey Transit services to Trenton count as intercity? How would you uh, classify what's what's there now? Um, so it, I would 
again, classifying is very difficult uh, because railroads are very flexible. Uh, but the Jersey Transit is probably in this description would be called regional. Um, I'm assuming that they're on pretty close to clock based schedules, haven't looked. Uh, but I would put that in the regional category. Okay. And then uh, Ron asks, would SEPTA in the Philadelphia area be considered a regional line? Uh, yes. And they're in the process of taking it to the next level so that it truly functions um, much better in that capacity. Um, and uh, we hope to do a blog that points to a, an interesting webinar about that uh, and the challenges of actually doing it there, even though it looks, um, but yes, uh, rep regional with, with getting better. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then, um, uh, going, getting some other questions. Um, we, we have board members around the country and Mark Hoover uh, is one of our board members who lives in Arizona and he actually also serves as our treasurer. And uh, Mark uh, asks, how do we convince people who've never seen this work and who are in a passenger rail desert like Arizona, he says, of the functionality of this? Uh, Mark says, I've been traveling uh, back and forth between Phoenix and Tucson a lot lately and see the problems with Interstate 10. That highway now is literally getting uh, several billions of dollars to try to, quote unquote, fix the traffic. And Mark says, I would love to be able to take the train rather than drive. Yeah, so one of the traps that I think rail advocates have fallen into um, across the country is the idea, well, we can't we need something to whet people's appetite. So let's just do something quick um, on the existing infrastructure and try to get something there so that we can show what it is. Um, and unfortunately, those really quick things end up not being quick, and then they don't prove the point. Um, and in, in my world, a very frustrating example of that is the Chicago to Quad Cities route, um, where we're going to, at this point, after 15 years, we're still just working on two trains a day. Um, but it's evangelizing is the key, saying it over and over again, being confident and getting people to think about the Brightline example from Orlando to Miami, or even the Denver example, um, where they launched with memory schedules from start. All right. Um, uh, moving on, uh, Sylvia says her main reason to use the train, and, and she says it's probably, this is probably the case for millions of other people, are climate and health concerns. Uh, is there more that you could say about how regional rail addresses uh, those two concerns? Um, so the key, so regional rail addresses climate and health, um, because if you want to get those, if you want trains to solve that problem, people have to ride the train. And if you want people to ride the train, the train has to be frequent, attractive, and dependable, and affordable. And so essentially what we're saying is, let's design for frequent, affordable, dependable, and reliable from the start. Mm -hmm. And I know, I mean, again, this is a Wisconsin example that I happen to be familiar with, but I know that there's been a lot of concern about expansion of the interstate, uh, you know, out of Mil in and out of Milwaukee because of the environmental health impacts uh, on the communities on either side and, you know, more uh, moving more of the, the volume of people moving around to rail would, would help with that. Um, but uh, there, uh, there were several comments uh, about how where today the only option is Amtrak, you have to make a reservation and it's uh, it, it's uh, you know more convenient to just be able to sort of go whenever you want. Clark asks, um, how do reservations fit into regional rail? Uh, so the way the Japanese do it is um, they have a car that doesn't require reservations. So you can reserve a seat if you want in a reserved seat car or you go to the non-reserved seat car. Um, and they have, the trains are really big and incredibly frequent. Um, so that's that's a good solution there. 
um, in Europe, uh, you can reserve a seat. And if somebody is sitting in it, when you get there, that person is expected to move. Uh, so, so those are two approaches for dealing with that. Uh, Amtrak and others force you to actually change your reservation. Um, I'm not sure I, that doesn't get to the flexibility portion of it that I would like to see. Okay. And um, how do we, you know, you, Rick, you, you, you spoke about how we got to where we, where we are today in the United States, at least. Um, how do we uh, turn a legacy commuter rail system into regional rail? Or do you, you know, and or do you know of uh, cities that have, have done this successfully somewhere? Well, so um, there are places where it's easy. So the Chicago to Kenosha um, is incredibly easy because there's no freight trains on it. Uh, the station, fortunately, the cities around the stations were not destroyed. They're still there. They're still very walkable. Um, and so it's a matter of the entity that, that wants it to fund a different operation. So you could do it tomorrow um, with additional operating costs and the existing equipment. And Metro has been making steps in that direction. So you, but you need the commitment to invest in running the more service first um, as you're, you're building up the market. And then the next level on that would buy, be buying better trains that accelerate faster, that have lower floors so that people can get it off faster um, and, re, uh, and dealing with fares in a different way so that you're not taking fares on the train. Um, so that's the easy side of it. If you've got a lot of freight on the line, then it requires a lot more of investment in building better infrastructure to make it work. Uh, so it's on a case by case basis, but it's certainly very, very doable. Okay. And um, here's a here's a fun question. Uh, Gary asks, how can regional rail help uh, with taking passengers to sporting events? Well, um, uh, uh, most recent example for me was uh, Oktoberfest in Frankfurt last September. Uh, but the, you know, roads don't deal very well with changes in flow, but railroads can do a lot better. One is because people can stand on the train. Um, and the other is because typically you've got a lot more capacity to run extra trains. So if you've got the capacity in place to have regional rail, um, then you've got the, you can add capacity through, either through adding more trains or having standees. I hope that's a good answer. And uh, alongside that, uh, you know, anyone can join the mailing list for Brightline, uh, which I've done just out of curiosity. I don't live anywhere near it, uh, but uh, I'm, I'm impressed by how often, you know, it's every week, uh, probably almost every day, they're sending out emails about the sporting events, the concerts, the things like that, that you can get to using their trains. Uh, so that's a, a real world example that's up and running in the United States. Uh, let's see, um, Roger Huff, uh, who lives in Chicago and is one of our dedicated volunteers on a technical committee that we have, among other things, asks, is the U.S. Department of Transportation working to get the Federal Transportation uh, Administration and FRA, or, or the Federal Transit Administration, FTA, and Federal Railroad Administration on the same page regarding regional rail? Uh, I don't have a solid answer to that question. Um, I think it's identified as a problem um, and probably think people are thinking about the solutions. Um, but you know, agencies in large part are supposed to implement the law and not think about how to change the law. So it's kind of up to us to figure out how to change, get the law changed so that they can work together better. All right. Uh, I, that's it for the questions that we have. Uh, are there any uh, words of conclusion that you want to share or, you know, final thoughts for now? Um,
I just want to, so Thor is saying a good analogy of regional rail is to think more of it as a subway system on a larger scale. And the two examples that I've actually witnessed of that, subways on a different scale, is Tokyo to Osaka, where the train essentially runs every three or four minutes, um, and Nan Nanjing to Shanghai, um, where the the trains run every three, four or five minutes with locals and expresses with the locals sitting in a, the side and while the express passes at 200 miles an hour. So certainly, yes, that is a good way to think of it. But, you know, we're making progress on this. Um, uh, you know, if you look at different operations around the country, like SunRail, you can see that this is starting to develop much better. Um, uh, Caltrain is a great example of moving in the right direction in a really big way. Um, the Amtrak services that California pays for, uh, we've got a lot happening around the country. Um, but one thing we really need to do is have much higher expectations um, for outside of that traditional commuter range and just get upset when somebody talks about two trains a day from Scranton to New York and say that's not acceptable. Um, or, you know, just three or four trains a day from Chicago to Green Bay. Um, these cities are way too important to have such limited service. Um, and we really need to start pushing our states uh, to think much bigger and more about connecting cities properly as opposed to just run uh, putting new cities on the map. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, I don't know. I hope this was helpful to people. There are, there are a couple others um, oh, okay. that, that have come in. And uh, with per perfect timing, you know, it's, it kind of lines up well with what you just said, Rick. Um, uh, Tor asks, uh, I, or says, I, I think that a good analogy for regional rail in this context, especially uh, in Michigan, is as more of a subway system on a larger scale. Uh, and he says half hourly instead of every few minutes, but a similar idea for network planning. Yes, yes. So that's what, that prompted the, the statement about, Tokyo to, to Osaka is essentially 175 mile an hour subway line. Um, but these these concepts also need to be worked at more at the subway level. So there's a, a blog called Pedestrian Observations where he's talked about not having regularly every hour schedules really gets in the way of running proper subway service in New York. So it goes both ways. Um, and that leads into Chark, Clark's statement about Ann Arbor, um, which is they've talked about Ann Arbor to Detroit commuter rail and almost got it started if it weren't for some political difficulties that killed it. But that was focused on three trains a day to Detroit and three in the morning and three trains back out. If you had hourly service, from Chicago to Detroit, then it's essentially commuter rail for Ann Arbor to Detroit. And as Clark is pointing out, a lot of traffic goes Chicago to Ann Arbor. Well, then you've got people getting off there at Ann Arbor and then other people getting on Ann Arbor and going to Detroit. So it's a better use of the, the train sets than having separate services. And, um... Mark Hoover asks, uh, I guess, about the role of DMUs in this. Can they help make this work? Yeah, so DMUs, uh, by taking away the weight, you have to have a lot of weight in the locomotive to push the wheels down onto the ground in order to pull the weight or onto the rails in order to pull the weight of the train. Uh, with the DMU and having the traction distributed through the train, you don't have to have all of that weight. So because you don't have all that weight, the train can accelerate faster. It's less expensive to operate, so you can run it more often. Um, and it can break faster, too, which makes it safer in, in that. So, mm -hmm. And I guess I should have said that uh, DMU stands for diesel, diesel multiple unit, for anyone who's not familiar with that term. Right. Um, and and I guess... Thor, I, I'm sorry, I, Thor just put in a comment that's an aside. Uh, 
So the, the chief operating officer of the Japanese National Railroad mocked uh, the Japanese high-speed line uh, the day before it was opened. He said, this is going to be a failure. Uh, most of the bureaucracy at Japan, Japan National Railroads was against building it. Um, and fortunately, there was uh, a guy who made it happen because if it weren't for him, then we might not have high-speed rail in the world. Um, so absolutely, it's going to be difficult. It takes thinking outside the box. Um, and again, yes, Mark is the, the visionary at Japan National Railroad who made it happen, got fired before the project was even finished and disgraced. And he had to sit up in the back row of the opening ceremony. Um, so as we had in a previous building a high speed line, a, 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 what, did, what did the German guy call it? A walk in the park? A pleasure cruise. It's not a pleasure, a pleasure cruise. <laughs> <laughs> it takes effort. Uh, so thank you all again for being if you're not a member please join us um, highspeedrail.us hit the join button if you are a member thank you very much we're ramping up for a big campaign um, in the spring uh, we got a real stretch budget we'll be sharing that with you later but uh, highspeedrail.us hit the join us button thank you very much for uh, your interest in and in being part of this effort. Yeah, thank you all. Take care.